All right, Kaiser kids, I wanted to touch base with you and uh, talk a little about the paper that you had from class a couple days ago that had the French Indian War on it with the, like the rectangle that had the sides over this where you put down the French and the uh, Indian tribes, the Huron and the Algonquin on one side and the English, the English colonists and the uh, Iroquois on the other. So you might want to have that out for this talk um, just so that kind of is a little easier for you. So one of the things you had to do in thinking about the French Indian War is kind of think about this political cartoon that you would uh, have seen back in the day if you were an English colonist. Uh, now, it doesn't seem like it's funny, but cartoon doesn't really always mean it's funny. It's supposed to make you kind of think. So if you look at this cartoon, uh, it's a, a snake all chopped up. And if you get really close to it, you can see that there are letters on there that signify the 13 colonies. So there's North Carolina towards the end of the snake. Uh, the New England part is up near the head. So this is a way for the colonists to think about, like, what would happen if we don't come together during this war? This was something that was on the minds of a lot of colonial leaders as they were facing fighting the French and the Native Americans. And they were worried that perhaps the French uh, would just come in and conquer because the colonies were so different from each other. They weren't organized together. They were just doing their own thing. So this actually was created by Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin created this cartoon to get people thinking about the idea of joining together. And it comes out of a meeting that's taking place in Albany, New York in 1754. The colonies send representatives to this meeting because everybody's super worried and freaking out about the French. Ben Franklin, his plan is that, well, one of the things we definitely should do is we should unite. We should have, instead of 13 different militias, we should have maybe one and we should have one government maybe running the thing. I mean, we know the king's in charge, but he's so far away. We have to do something. And this is really just a, a document that doesn't go very far. The people at the Albany meeting like it, and Ben Franklin obviously likes it. He creates a political cartoon to get people to think about it. But when the representatives take it back to their colonies, and nobody's really ready for this yet. Nobody really wants to uh, unite. It, it kind of like be you meeting someone really special on your first date and asking them if they wanted to get married on the first date, they'd be like, whoa, slow down. You know, geez, this, we have a lot to learn about each other. These colonies weren't really ready to be married to each other yet. But the idea, this is the first time, that's why this is a big deal. It's the first time that this plan is put forth and it comes from Ben Franklin. The colonies reject it, but they'll come back around in about 20 years and be totally into it. Okay, so let's talk more about the war. At first, the English weren't really into this war, and there wasn't a main priority until a few things happened that really get there, uh, get them going. One would be when a very famous British general is killed. Now, the story goes that General Braddock is obviously a regular, right, a red coat. He's got a big army, and he's being helped out by the militia of Virginia with young George Washington by his side. Again, there's a lot of uh, animosity between uh, the Redcoats and the militia. I mean, maybe animosity is not the best word. It's just like varsity, junior varsity. Don't don't try to tell us how to do things. This is what the general would say to George Washington. The general Braddock would want to like march across Pennsylvania, cutting down trees and making a road as he goes, trying to find the French. Whereas George Washington said, that's really going to be hard. It's going to take forever. The French and Indians are going to be waiting for us. He'll probably ambush us. But nobody listened uh, to Washington. General Braddock being a regular, meaning a redcoat, uh, very much the varsity would not listen to Washington. And in the end, there's going to be an ambush. Just like Washington said, the Indians are going to hide behind trees and become like snipers and wipe out the English. General Braddock will be killed. He'll die uh, a little bit later. But George Washington will have to step up and get all the English out of there on a retreat. In fact, George Washington himself will almost be shot. Several bullets will kind of come close to him, pass through his coat, but none actually strike his body, and it's kind of a miracle that he survives. But he will get the British out of there. Uh, he'll retreat in an orderly fashion and save lots of lives. So Braddock is dead. The English are now freaking out because one of their top generals is dead. Maybe it's time for them to take this war seriously. Another thing is now Washington becomes well-known. Even though he's such a loser, he keeps losing over and over again during this war, it's how he handles himself that makes him 
a great person in the colonies. Everybody admires George Washington. He's physically a big person. He's got great character. He's a gentleman. Uh, apparently, he's a great dancer. And everyone loved George Washington. He was basically the total package when it comes to, to being like a colonial gentleman and a soldier. Now, after uh, Braddock is killed, Britain decides no matter what this war costs, we're going to pay it. We need more ships. We need more soldiers. We're going to beat the French. They are our arch enemy. They must pay. And it's going to cost tons of money. The British are willing to pay it. And in fact, we'll basically put it on a credit card, right? They'll go in debt to fight this war. And you guessed it, after the war, they're going to have to pay this debt back. And so they're going to ask the colonists to pay a little bit more in taxes to pay for the war. Uh, and of course, the colonists are going to freak out and that's going to lead to the American Revolution. In our uh, folder this week, you're going to see a video, um, about a 10-minute video about uh, Braddock and Washington marching through Pennsylvania. You'll see uh, just how uh, crazy it was in the battle scenes and Braddock being killed and George Washington stepping up. So watch that video. You'll probably have to do a discussion post on it uh, soon. So let's, let's look at this map. This is a map kind of our neighborhood. On the very bottom right of your screen, kind of off the screen, would be where you live. That's where Columbus would be. And you can maybe see that the red squares equal uh, forts. And so you, you might see a Fort Duquesne. Well, that was a French word. And when the French lose that city, the English will change the name and make it Fort Pitt in honor of their British prime minister. And that's where, of course, we get Pittsburgh today. So that's Pittsburgh. There's some other places you probably will recognize, like Niagara, kind of the Canadian-New York border. Ticonderoga, you might have a pencil with Ticonderoga on it. It's, well, it's a fort during the French and Indian War. But I want to focus where the red arrow is pointing today, and that's Quebec City. We've learned about Quebec City a little bit earlier on this year when we talked about the explorers. Samuel de Champlain, remember he arrived in what would be Canada and started Quebec. And remember, Quebec City is inside the province of Quebec, the same way that we have New York City inside of New York. Right? So Quebec City is that city right there on the St. Lawrence River. It's going to be the scene of the most important battle of the French and Indian War. In fact, it's really the only battle that you have to know by name. And it's really the turning point, And it marks the end of the French. So by the time we get to 1759, the English are all in on this war. They put a lot of money into it. And they're ready to win uh, in Quebec. The Battle of Quebec is in 1759. And you can see that this is on a river, right? So the city of Quebec is on the other side of the river, up on a hill. And uh, the fort that the English had to try to take was at the top of this hill. The problem was there was no easy way to get to that fort. So several days went by. The English would go up and down this river looking for a way to get to the top of the hill without being seen or being uh, sniped by the French soldiers up there. And as history goes... A lady comes down to the river, a French lady, to wash her clothes. She uses a little path that she had made. The English watch her wash her clothes. They see her using this path going up to the top. They all use the path, sneak up her, her washing path, if you will, and attack the French and, in fact, defeat the French at the top of the hill in Quebec. So it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, all this is based on you know, history turns on whether this lady did her laundry and whether the English saw her doing it. She did do her laundry. She did use the path. The English saw her use the path. They used the path. They beat the French. And now I'm speaking to you in English because the French lose the French and Indian War. Also on the slide, you see at the very bottom uh, castle type thing today. That is the, called the Chateau Frontenac. It's just like the fanciest hotel in Canada, maybe. And uh, I've posted a couple videos. One is about modern-day Quebec City. It's about four minutes. It's kind of a tourist video. You would like it. It's going to look a lot like this, uh, like Beauty and the Beast. It's a very much a old European-looking French city. In, so, in fact, outside of Paris, Quebec City is the largest French-speaking uh, city in the world. So Quebec has still got a large French culture, French language, even though the French lose at this battle. And there's another two-minute video or so about the Chateau Frontenac. So you can watch that too. It's a very swanky and cool uh, castle that you could stay in if you ever went to Quebec. But as I, like I said, the French are losing. They lost the war. They lost 
uh, at Quebec. So that means they have to sign a peace treaty in 1763 called the Treaty of Paris. So the French government is out, but a lot of French people stay. They stay in Quebec and other parts of Canada. But today, the Queen of England is the monarch who's the sovereign, the head of state over Canada. It's officially a bilingual country, but in the end, the British are in charge, thanks to uh, the Battle of Quebec and the French and Indian War, and maybe because that lady decided to do her laundry at that very moment. So the war is over. The French are out. The English are now running the show. Uh, so this neighborhood here around the Great Lakes uh, is now belongs to the English. The problem is nobody really told the Native Americans that the war was over. You know, they weren't invited to the peace treaty. So just because the French signed doesn't mean that the Indians are going to stop fighting. So that brings me to Pontiac. Pontiac was a chief of a tribe called the Ottawa, and he is going to lead a rebellion. He's going to keep the war going, if you will, against the English. So Chief Pontiac and 14 other tribes uh, are going to be attacking English forts uh, around the Great Lakes. These guys, the Indians, they don't want to give up. They don't want to give their land to the English. They know that the English will be spreading out and taking their land. So they're going to continue to wage the war. And in fact, if you think about Pontiac, you could ask your parents about this. Uh, there was a brand of car in America for a long time called a Pontiac, named after uh, the Ottawa chief Pontiac. He was from Michigan. They built a lot of cars in Michigan up around the Detroit area. And that little symbol on the, on the screen now, the kind of silver arrow with the red middle, that is the symbol of uh, Pontiac, so the car, Pontiac would have that maybe on their hood, and it's an arrowhead to remind you of Chief Pontiac. So the Indians are going to keep fighting, so the king is in a bit of a pickle. What do I do? We won the war, but the natives are still on the war path. The king has to keep the subject safe. Everybody in the colonies would like to start spreading out to the land they just took from the French. The problem is the Indians are still there. So the king issues a proclamation of 1763. So it's a royal proclamation, meaning proclaim, right? That's what it means. The root word is proclaim. That you can't, the colonists, can't go into the territory we just took. I can't guarantee your safety, the king would say. You know, it would be like your parents telling you, you can't go outside right now and play in the yard. There's bears everywhere. I can't guarantee that you might be safe. The king thought he was doing what was right, keeping the colonists safe until the Indian issue could be settled. But the colonists are going to be get, getting more and more angry at the proclamation of 1763. So uh, this is going to be something that the British government issues. They're going to order the colonists to stay put, and the colonists are going to get mad. It's, very, it's the beginning of the colonists getting more and more angry at um, the British government. And so by the time we get to the 1770s, they've had enough. You put this... Proclamation of 1763, along with the taxes that are coming, and it's going to lead to revolution. So I'll stop talking now. Don't pay any attention to any of the slides that are coming. That's stuff we'll use later. Um, but just kind of re rewatch this again. Watch the videos about Quebec, the Chateau Frontenac, and uh, George Washington is battle scene with Braddock uh, in the Pennsylvania wilderness. And that's good.